I'm just going to take a moment while I have the mic to introduce this incredible moment in time. Um, <clears throat> the RHI Summit was coming here. It's my last weekend in the position. And I knew I had an incredibly special opportunity to be able to uh, put a spotlight on the man and an era in New York City and New York City nightlife um, for which if it did not happen, we might not have ever even needed um, a New York City Mayor's Office of Nightlife as a watchdog to make sure that this nightlife and those who run it are protected, appreciated, supported, and resourced. And so um, because of this moment and this opportunity, um, I was so grateful for the um, relationship that I have uh, to be able to invite the one and only uh, Peter Gation here to speak with us all today and to be interviewed also by the incomparable Mel Ottenberg, uh, editor-in-chief of Interview Magazine. So no one's here to see me speak, so I turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ariel. Thank you so much for asking me to interview Peter Gation, legend, icon, true king of clubs for New York and beyond. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Peter. It's so much fun being in New York, you know. <laughs> it really is a great city. <laughs> yeah, I miss it. I'm sure we miss you. Um, how was it coming here? Pardon me? How was the trip here? Oh, I just, you know, I, you know I, I never, like, just jet through customs. There's always, like, you know, uh, <laughs> A little bit of sometimes secondary, but this time it went really smoothly. Um, and uh, it's gotten better over the years. You know, I got a waiver probably about eight, nine years ago that allowed me to come back. And, you know, in the beginning it was always in secondary, and now it's, it's smoother than it used to be. Before I get into like what I already I already wanted to ask you, I'm just curious. Like when you come and you have this rush of emo emotion and memory, probably about New York, what are the things like club wise that you're most thinking of? Well, you're talking about yeah, you know, what happened a long time ago. Like like you just come right now, right? You got here yesterday, like, and you're thinking well, about oh, New York. It's you know, I night. I smile on my face, and I hate yeah. to bring this up, but I gotta bring it up. I gotta, I gotta take, get my looks in when I can. I'm, I'm reading in Washington Post this morning or New York Times. I remember they're talking about Dominion voting systems, and their next target is Rudy Giuliani. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I break out into like. Oh my God! You know, does this reinforce karma or not? But yeah, when I come into town, um, and he deserves worse. You know, it's not over yet. And, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, Big round of applause for that. But no, but you know, when I come into the city, it's it's like you know, you just remember every, you know, you drive, you know, go by a restaurant, you remember that restaurant. You just, you know, it's just the energy in New York. You know, everything from the retail, the clothing, you know, everything that's around here, the energy. Um, and the creativity, it's like, you know, and it's well beyond Manhattan now. I think, you know, 20 years ago, it was like Brooklyn was, you know, you almost like you never even thought of going to Brooklyn. And you certainly aspired to, you know, go to Manhattan. And, and three, four years ago, before COVID, I, you know, I, I got a fair amount of calls. Peter, speak into the mic. I'm sorry. I got a fair amount of calls wanting to, uh, you know, see what I thought of different space or whatever. And I explored the Brooklyn scene. And I got to tell you, I was uh, really impressed, especially a place that, you know, like House of Yes, and I'm not saying it because you're here. Um, you can read some of the interviews I've done in the last two, three years, and I, you know, and I said you know, they really get it. And there, there's some places that are really getting it. But I, 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 one thing I loved about what we did in the uh, 90s especially, and the 80s also, is we really put a lot of energy into getting a diverse crowd. And I think a lot of it has evolved now where everybody looks the same in, in a lot of clubs. And I, you know, again, I'm not an expert. It's not like I go out every night and... and but, that whole bottle service movement, whatever, I, you know, I, I think probably makes a lot of money for clubs, but I think it, it, we were much more, I think, egalitarian in our day than you are now. Um, or, you know, you didn't have to pop 250 or $500 for a, a bottle or a table or whatever. Um, in fact, you know, our, you had a better chance of getting into the clubs if you were, you know, creative with your clothes, not that you had to be sequenced from ear to ear or whatever, but you know, you showed little accessories or whatever. You had a much better chance of getting in somebody pulled in a limousine, um, just the way it was. Um, let's go back to the beginning of you in New York, which is 40 years ago exactly, right? 
You, you started in 83. Yeah, I moved here in 83. And opening Limelight was, from a city standpoint, easy, hard? Well, navigating anything in New York City is really difficult, from you know, building department, uh, you know, uh, complying with the CFOs and P's and, and, and whatever. And you got to understand, when, and this is probably hard to believe for most of you because you're younger. When I, we, we opened Limelight, uh, literally, you know, you know, big box stores like uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, th those were abandoned buildings. There, there was nothing there. The whole 20th Street was all light manufacturing. No, when I say no restaurants, there were no restaurants. So it was really a really o o oasis. I mean, there was, yeah. You know, I mean, it was Sixth Avenue or whatever. But but New York was, you know, desolate was at more, night. No, it was, yeah, it was more raw. It just was. Yeah. Scary raw and. Uh, I don't know about the scary part. Okay. <laughs> okay. Exciting. <laughs> you know, Creative. You know, since I was 16 years old, I remember you know, reading about Times Square and the dying. Of, you know, first time going to New York, you know, visiting Times Square. So, I mean, yeah, there was a rawness to it, but there was certainly, uh, there was a lot of charm to it back then, too. Like I said, it was, yeah, my staff, like, I, I, I talked to people even like five, eight years ago, like, whether their staff, where's their staff? Well, they all live in Jersey, or they live in, you know, Brooklyn, or they live in the Bronx, or whatever. You know, back then, like, a lot of the staff lived on, you know, Avenue A, B, and C, First Avenue, or whatever. It was affordable. And then did it hit right away, or did it take a while no, to no, really hit? Club, clubs, uh, you know, my experience, anyway. They hit right away, or you're in deep shit. Right. <laughs> it's just, you know, um, and it's, you know, and, and, you know, I guess a lot of people are in the business, so you start to understand, but a lot of people just think you open your doors, you have a terrific sound system, and, you know, people are smoking, the doors are smoking, the people get in and, you know, it doesn't work that way, man. You have to work it. You have to have events, you have to have, like I said, we put a lot of energy in a real diverse crowd, which meant, you know, different interests or whatever, different invites, even for the same night, for, you know, targeting different crowds, whether it's a literature crowd or art crowd or, or whatever. And then you, you know, you do special parties, you know, whether you get a Mick Jagger or somebody's birthday party, or this or that or whatever, you know, getting page six, which, you know, it probably still is, but back then was, you know, a big deal or daily news. And that's, that was your marketing. You know, we didn't advertise, there was no radio or anything like that. We never did that, you know, that kind of mass, mass, uh, mass media stuff. And so, right, so one of the big parts of your jobs was knowing who all the coolest people were, hiring them, hiring them away from the other places, and getting them to do their thing, right? Not necessarily, you know, when I got here, the, um, the benchmark, I guess, was Studio 54, but, you know, Studio 54 at that point, I think Ian and then Steve, you know, had their troubles in about 1980, 81. Um, and what I called it, the, the uh, era of, you know, miles of neon, chrome, spinning wheels, had been done to death. And there's no way I thought I could come, okay, I'm going to come to New York, I'm going to have more spinning wheels than Studio 54 did, or I'm going right. to have more chrome or neon, than, you know, that's not going to work. It wasn't it's, cool anymore. It wasn't so much cool, but it wasn't, it wasn't going to be cool in ten, you know, yeah. three years. You know, like I said, you know, one club has ten spinning wheels, you have 20, big deal. Um, so I just thought that art and architecture were the way to go, and my instructions to a real estate person had been, you know, please find me a church. But something, yeah, architecturally interesting, high ceilings, obviously, um, and lo and behold, the church, you know, was a um, drug rehab center, and a woman had gotten in trouble, and she had paid 600000 a year before. Next year, she's asking me in six. I looked at the building, <laughs> didn't negotiate. I didn't say like, you know, we're taking me in five nine five. It was like, <laughs> what do I sign? Um, you know, churches are perfect in that they have high ceilings. The architecture is, you know, incredible. A lot of doors. So to comply with CFOs and that kind of stuff, um, you know, it helps. And then you know, you talk in in your book um, about the real sad mid 80s with when AIDS was really at its peak scary where you really didn't know where you're how you were getting it etc what what kept it alive at that point because you really explode around like 88 and then into the 90s like what what kept it going basically I always felt that the gay crowd contributed so much energy on any given night that I always you know no matter what we did we tried to have an event that we draw at least you know 75, 100, 150. There would always be at least 20% gay crowd. 
And the energy level, you know, and they, they created energy level. They, you know, they came with the costumes. They were on the dance floor. They were the fun, fun people. Not that the streets were boring, but they were definitely inspired. The gays were much more inspiring. There's no other way of putting it. Word. Um, so by the 85, um, yeah, I remember, like, having the staff that, you know, healthy, good-looking guys, whatever, and then three weeks later, they looked like, you know, Tom Hanks from Philadelphia. I mean, it hit that quickly. Um, and, you know, we got to know those people. So it was, it really hurt. It really hurt. So anyway, um, sorry. So anyway, at that point, we, we sort of just went after more the, quite frankly, the bridge and tunnel crowd, not the, and there's just, like I said, there's just, just no, there's no gay, gay activity in town. And at that point, New York, for, you know, New York, San Francisco gotten hit the hardest by far. Chicago hadn't, and London hadn't. And that's when I decided to take the show on the road, so to speak. So we did London and Chicago, I think in 85, 86, you know, give, give or take. And in New York, um, and we were able to survive, but like I said, it was, it was mainly a bridge and tunnel crowd. It's just, you know. But we had to develop a base of tourists. Like, climate light on any given night, a Monday night, you could be you know, 30 below zero. I'm exaggerating. Could, you know, whether someone had climbed. We were always good for 400 people. You know, and it would climb 400 on Monday, 400 on Tuesday, you know, maybe 600 on Wednesday, five, 600 on Thursday, and then you know, more on tour. So we always had a, you know, a base of tourists, and I think that was from the you know, early 80s, where, like I said, we had everybody from Jack Nicholson to Tina Turner's idea of parties, to, you know, uh, uh, Pearl Jam. To, you know, I mean, we had a lot of stuff going on back then, so we had developed a reputation. I think that allowed us to survive. And then when... You know, when Warhol died and then everyone said New downtown was dead, downtown was over, everything was over, that's when everything really started pumping for you, right? No, I mean, not, you've, I, I you got off, it together. I think you're off a couple of years. Okay. Um, <sighs> well, he died in 87. Exactly. Right. And that was, like I said, when 85, 86 hit, that, that's when, you know, there was like the real cold reality that, that you know, people are scared and, right. and you know, no, like I said, nobody knew how they got it back then, whether it was dirty glass or a kiss or, or whatever. Um, so, no, I did my stuff in London and Chicago and then early 90s is when I sold London and sold Chicago and then came back and um, Palladium was, uh, I'm not going to say really hurting, but they, you know, the, the, the owners didn't really want it anymore and we negotiated, you know, they basically gave me the place for free. Um, and uh, we, tunnel was shut down at the point, and and we, you know, triple the size of it. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. And then in '94, I think '93 or '94, you had Clubs USA. So it's '90s. There was a revival, and that people sort of figured, okay, you don't get AIDS from a dirty glass. And I think uh, the gay community probably curbed its its promiscuous, you know, a, you know, a little bit also. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's sort of a, a, a joie de vivre in the 90s that I compared to the early East. But, but that only started in the 90s, 89, 90, well, whatever, you know, give or take. When you had four hot clubs running at the same time and you're working 16-hour days, were you loving it? <laughs> well, yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah it's you love, really you, crazy. You, you love it because you hate it so much. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Fair. Um, you know, I, I was sort of compared to this thing, you know, I was kidding, you know, watching Ed Sullivan, you see the guy with the plates... You know, spinning them, and you'd have to run from one pole to the other. Well, you know, that, that was me on steroids. Right. And you got to understand, and the the diversity of the, you know, we were doing four clubs. We were doing, give or take, 28 parties a week, okay, which meant, you know, printing invitations, printing, uh, designing invitations, distributing invitations, and then the... Teams of people, and, and everybody, you know, I didn't have outside promoters, so to speak. You whether it worked for us, or you could kick in sometimes, but, you know, for the majority of my staff were, you know, I was their only employer. And dealing with a, you know, whether it's a Mark Berkeley, who's, or, you know, a really sort of snappy, sharp queen to um, uh, going to Sunday, you know, I remember going to, like, Sunday night, a tunnel one night, and there's, I forget it was JC or whatever, and it's you know, mayhem of going that, that night. And then going to Limelight, and it was Rock and Roll Church, and, you know, having a, uh, like a Pearl Jam on stage or whatever. And then going to Club USA, we used to have a night called, um, I think it was Bump. When I would tell you there's 3,500 
sweaty, <laughs> like pumping muscle, whatever guys in there. Like it was like hotter than hell. And then you know, going to Palladium, you know, where we I remember doing you know Broadway Bears, where you know Nathan uh, Lang is, is you know um, you're, you're hosting it. So uh, yeah, it was exciting as hell. Is that? And then there's yeah. all the, the you know, if everybody's in the club, there's, there's all the back problem. You know, everything from the security to uh, ticket takers to uh, cashiers to bartender. You, you got to keep an eye on all those people. And I'm not saying I did, you know, but you had systems, you know, developed for that kind of stuff. Um, and then you know, cops. Yeah, you know, uh, especially after Giuliani got in, you know, were a real nuisance. Also, like I, I remember nights where, you know, they come in at eleven o'clock. Say okay, nobody can come in until we do all our inspection. They have a building department and cabaret associated, this, that, whatever. There, and hold the door up for an hour and a half. It'd be like literally two thousand people. Out. They come out and then give you a ticket for a disorderly <laughs> premise because there's too many people on the sidewalk. It's like, well, you know, uh, it was that kind of insanity. Uh, yeah, we were. When I say we were, yeah, I, I think because I, I was, you know, and I'm not. Uh, bragging here, I was sort of the, the face of nightlife, at least, uh, you know, people that didn't go to nightclubs and knew that, you know, they read about me or, or, or whatever. But um, Giuliani was brutal on all of us. Um, I think me especially, but he was, he was brutal. He was like mean, son of a bitch. And no, you know, it's it like, I think I was talking to Bob a few minutes ago, like, you know, and this is the last I talk about Giuliani, I promise. <laughs> But you know, I was looking at this poor Ruby Friedman and this other black woman, and I don't know if you're, you guys are acquainted with you know, in Georgia was an election, uh, just an election worker. And Giuliani highlighted her and tortured her, you know, made her whole life unbearable. And this is just a poor friggin' uh, person who works elections or whatever. That, you know, he has uh, just hate that, you know, I just don't understand. Um, but anyway, last I mentioned him, I promise. Before we get into and that, and I don't go to bed thinking about them. Just so you know, yeah. so well, I mean, it must be it must be good that. coming back to New York, knowing that New York really, really, really hates Rudy Giuliani. Uh, we it, fucking hate Giuliani. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I was saying to Ariel yesterday that, like, I, I don't know how this is possible, but maybe we hate. Rudy Giuliani more than Donald Trump because I mean Donald Trump you can laugh at and be like wow this whole thing but Giuliani there's no there's no fun to it no even private fun it's just horrible that's okay, all yeah. that's my opinion no, but I, mean, I think both, I think I speak for lots of New York yeah, I mean I they're that. both megalomaniacs and that's the problem yeah they just and and God forbid like a Giuliani and I said it I remember doing an interview I think it was Daily News uh, if Giuliani had the resources of President of the United States with the you know, CIA and the FBI and, and every other alphabet uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, agency. Could you imagine, you know, with New York, just with the New York Police Department, I mean, he was beyond you know, Nazi brutal. Um, but anyway, let's stop talking about him. Before, okay, so, so it's, that, it's that time, right? And you've got four clubs. Right. What, let's say none of this shit happened and it kept on moving. Did you have a plan? Did you have plans for New York? But no, no, specifically honest, no, no, that, like, didn't no, happen because things... No, no, no things be honest happen. with you, yeah, I was, I think it was 43 or 44 when the shit hit the fan. You know, my plans were, you know, natural graduation for me was whether to get into the hotel business mm -hmm. or I was going to get in the movie business. And I, 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 you know, I had uh, executive well, produced uh, Bronx Tale. Right. I executive produced the movie called Faithful. And I, you know, and, and I met... Yeah, a lot of the big studio guys when we were selling uh, or pitching uh, Bronx Tale, and I sort of said, you know, these guys aren't that much smarter than I am. So, you know, not that I thought I was going to become a studio head, but I, I knew I could go there. And you know, I was 44 at the time, and it's like, uh, you know, do I want to be up till six o'clock in the morning all the time? The answer is no. So I sort of had a loose plan of of selling uh, or whatever. In fact, I had a think I had an offer back then was like 15 million dollars for two of them. But anyway. Um, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, thinking back on the 90s, especially when things like bottle service were really created at sun, Sunday night at Tunnel, what else What else are you most proud of okay, for but, creating? No, no, just so you know, on the record, Tunnel did not create bottle service. Okay, okay. All right, we had a, uh, we had a small area where you could 
sort of buy a bottle, but it wasn't like, you know, there was no menus you or know, you know, post tents on the, on the table saying, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. And if you're referring to Sunday nights at um, Tunnel, <clears throat> we used to have a thing that was called Champagne Bin. And it wasn't a we promoter or whatever, but uh, different posses would, there's a long barn tunnel, would sit across each other, stand across each other, and see how many bottles of champagne they could buy. And, and they didn't want you to remove them off the top of the bar. So you'd have like 25 champagne bottles on you know, both sides of the bar. And we're talking, you know, back then, Cristal, I think it was a buck eighty, two hundred dollars or something. Um, but no, we weren't, yeah, you know, we didn't pioneer or perfect the bottle service. That's, you know, I want to take credit, and I don't want to take credit for that. Okay, I stand corrected, but it's, it sounds really fun. Okay, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I only went once. I went, I, I did used to go to Tunnel a lot. I, I'm trying to remember what I was doing. What was Tunnel in 94 like? Because I was definitely going well, depending on 94 night. Friday night. Okay, that was Techno? more of a, that, no, it was sort of like a, a fashion-oriented night. Um, you remember we had the library downstairs, so there was probably about four dance floors down, you know, at the place. And then there was you know, the fun things like the, the rooms on the side, you could jump in the, the, all the balls and, and, you know, um, but it was a, uh, you know, it was a hip night, especially when you start talking hip to, you know, numbers of three and 3,500 people, it's hard to get three, 3,500, you know, re reasonably hip people. Uh, no, it is. You know, I yeah. mean, th those are big numbers. No, I remember. And then I was, I was nine. Wait, how I must have been nineteen. In no, I was twenty. And I, and it was the summer. And I'd we go to tunnel uh, like one a.m. And I'd be like, these people are not right. And then six a.m. hits, and suddenly out of the blue, everyone starting to look great. And I'm like, wait a second. And I didn't know. You know what I mean? I didn't know about after hours and shit. So all my friends would leave, and I'd be so tired just watching it slowly transform into something else. It was incredible. Because I kept being like, I guess Tunnel's not cool. And then by 6 a.m., you're like, oh, Tunnel's fucking cool. Like, this is fucking insane. Well, again, yeah, something, you know, something that was, you know, Listen, somebody has to pay the freight in the nightclub business. And you know, when I say right. pay the freight, somebody's got to, you know, back then, I think we were charging $15, $20 or whatever. So it's mostly tourists and, and, and people that, you know, want to be part of Manhattan scene or, or you know, want to see it or, or whatever. So um, the night, that, the way that was, night was orchestrated, it was a Friday. We did both at Palladium or, or you know, whatever. So early part of the night, I'll say early till 2, 2.30 was probably 80% straight, 20% gay. And then by 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, it started, you know, the, the numbers, you know, inverted. And I have a feeling that's what you're talking about now. Yeah, I mean, I guess you paid the, the, the big, the big paying crowd was there, Bridge well, yeah, Tunnel, you know, whatever, yeah, listen, we're leaving but, but, by 6 yeah, and then you know, a whole it, other Again, crowd everybody's sitting here, they're involved in it. Putting on a night, a, a, a production in a nightclub on any given, is not inexpensive. I mean, oh, there's yeah, a yeah. lot, you know, everything from insurance, this air conditioning, to a lot of stuff, you know, to even repairs and maintenance, like the amount of abuse a building takes, you know, getting three, four, even 1,800, whatever the case may be, you know, there's a lot of repairs and maintenance and, and uh, it's it's endless. It's really a complicated business. I, I think what I meant was the bridge and tunnel comes in, has the best time. It's their n night, and then after a while, it becomes something else. It was just very incredible to see that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So and it was, I think it the was more working the whole time. Yeah, and I think the more seasoned Manhattan nights sort of know that the you know, real action starts, you know, after one one thirty. Exactly. This is way I was in college. I did not know better. Right. I didn't know anything right. until that. I learned there. Right. Um, I was not cool. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, all right. We're almost running out of time, um, and I can talk to you forever because I have many questions for you. But like, what, what, what sage advice can you give this crowd of nightlife people, Peter Gation, as the king of clubs forever? Uh, one of them was never get high in your own supply. But, um, and, and like any organization, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, your support staff is what will make you or break you. It's just that simple. And if you can try and inspire a loyalty that you're, you know, you know not you're doing God's work by any means, but you're, you're doing something that's, especially in New York, you know, you know, you're doing something that's going to become institutional so, you know, in years to come or whatever. And you're part of a culture that makes the city so special. 
and you can have a lot of fun, do it, et cetera, et cetera. But you're, you know, like I said, you know, support staff's got to be, and I, you know, talking for everything from management to security to ticket to or whatever, you know, that everybody's pleasant, everybody's happy. You know, I guess that, you know, <clears throat> some people sort of, sort of holdovers like thought that you could really, really you know, rude to people because that's the way it is. And <laughs> no, you can't be rude to people. You know, it's just, it's not that world, that, you know, out there. Um, but it's a complicated business, not to discourage anybody, it's a complicated business. Um, I was watching your daughter Jen Gation's doc last night, Limelight, which I highly recommend to people. Um, and it really made me want more um, from that time. You know what I mean? Like you, you Google Club USA, you don't see that much. Are there any, which is crazy as someone who luckily went, is there anything coming up in the future where we will see much more of your legacy? Well, we are present, you know, Nick Pileggi, the guy that wrote uh, Goodfellas, you know, wrote a screenplay, and we we're developing it, and sort of came to the decision that the story was too long to tell in two hours. So right now, so we're in development with the people from Euphoria, and when I say in development, I mean development. I don't mean, well, yo, it's definitely, it's, we're opening, uh, we're starting to shoot next week or next month or whatever. Uh, but we got attached to, you know, a few very serious writers to it. And whether it goes anywhere or not, yeah, um, obviously I'm hopeful. But, um, you know, and it's a, story where, you know, it's a story about New York also. It's not just about me. I mean, transformation in New York and, and um, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, that we uh, get it done. To be continued. To be continued, yeah. All right, I'm being, I'm being, I'm getting yanked off the stage. Okay. Um, Peter. Thank you for being here. Okay, listen, it was a real pleasure, everybody. Uh, and, um, great being here. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, switch on. Check, check. Thank you so much. So, um, for those of you who don't know the entire Peter Gation saga story, do watch Limelight, uh, the movie uh, by his daughter Jen Gation that explains the real criminalization of not only an industry but a man who ultimately was deported unnecessarily and having him here is actually a real gift and had to get a special visa to be here. He was thrown out simply for the existence of throwing great New York nightlife um, history. And so please do inform yourselves about that because it really does demonstrate how far we've really come as an industry and as a city. And to demonstrate that a little bit further, I'm bringing some of our current future nightlife empresarios and legends to talk about that journey. And so I'd like to welcome Richie Romero from Nebula. And, K oh, it's working now. Uh, Kay Burke uh, from House of Yes, legendary. And also, we are bringing up Rob Bookman, who is counsel uh, for the Hospitality Alliance and who was an attorney at the time. And then I thought I would just join them. I was talking to um, Arielle yesterday, and, and she also said that, you know, if 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 Ariel had had someone before, if you had had a predecessor, that predecessor would have been a great watchdog on the bullshit that Peter Gation was going through. Um, it is crazy to read and watch docs and stuff about the time to just think how crazy um, and unfair uh, the idea that nightlife is inherently evil or in that um, the people throwing the places that are so fun um, are the devil. I mean, it's just insane. Do you guys feel like the city's giving you that now, though, in general? I would say yes and no. There's a lot of support, thanks to the culture and a lot of evolution that's happened. I would say when it comes down to trying to obtain a liquor license, that's actually really hard. <laughs> Uh, and you're treated like a criminal before you even open your doors and have a chance to be a criminal. Interesting. I second that. 
<laughs> you had mentioned to me that Peter really changed the game with cabaret and liquor license when we were talking last week. Can you, can you speak on that? Sure. For, first of all, if you haven't gotten his book, <laughs> The Club really King, good. definitely buy the book. It's available on Amazon. I had it delivered in 24 hours. It's fantastic. Um, he did change the game. I mean, I go back, you know, we did his licensing work, my law firm. You know, we, you know, we got him his liquor licenses. We got him his, you had to have a cabaret license in it if you had, you had dancing. Um, and while there was Studio 54 for a brief shining moment, it, that was really just a place for, you know, for deep-pocketed white people, basically. He changed the game. He made nightlife democratic. Um, different people from different backgrounds in the same, on the same dance floor at the same night was, it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but it was revolutionary at the time. Um, and it, it took somebody with a tremendous amount of guts and foresight, you know, to see that and to make it happen. There were gay bars and gay clubs, and there were straight bars and straight clubs, there were bridge and tunnel clubs, you know, and there were, you know, wealthy people places. He made it all happen in one place. He made it fun. He made it democratic. And, um, you know, and he was the club king. Um, amen. Uh, what, how's, how's running a club these days? It's a lot different. Um, you know, I, I used to work for Peter. I worked at Limelight Tunnel USA and uh, Palladium. What were you, 10? <laughs> I was young. I started at 16 years old, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep that. Juliana might come after me. Um, it, was, it was all different ecosystems on the one roof. It was like a school cafeteria, and everyone got together exactly what you were saying. And now it's more, it's more segregated. Uh, you see it. Um, there's more identity nights. Like back then, the identity nights still had the different ecosystems. And now you'll have it where it's hip hop, it would be, let's say, more of an urban crowd, it'd be more of a bridge and tunnel crowd, it would be more of deep house crowd, it'd be a commercial EDM crowd. It's a lot more segregation right now. And you know, that's that's the sad part of it. Yeah. And you know, that's why I miss the old days, because it was, you know, the school cafeteria and everyone with these different ecosystems and mingling together. Yeah. And it was it's New York, that's what New York is. It was a melting pot. And we're a melting pot that's divided, like in a in segregation, yeah. I would speak to that even in, even in Brooklyn. House of Yes is in Brooklyn and even all of these new cool little bars and venues that pop up. It's like the subcultures have subcultures. And even you're saying like, oh, the hip hop. Well, guess what? There's like subsects of each and everything, which I think is very beautiful because holistically as our city, we are all part of the same city, all part of the, the nightlife culture, the night people collective. And yeah, we just aren't really mixing so much on the dance floors, but people do get to find their niche and uh, yeah, they're really, they're dedicated community. And so there's, you know, there's a benefit to it too. But we, it's a world of difference. Those who saw the police officer, you know, this guy's like the number two, you know, guy in the police department of a 35,000 police department. We have a larger police department than most countries have armies. And to see him here today talking about, you know, the way he was talking, and to have you know a position like Ariel here, and to have a mayor who calls himself the nightlife mayor, um, is a world of difference from what we you know we dealt with. You know, my kids grew up thinking uh, you know Giuliani's middle name was you know uh, Nazi bastard. You know, because I, <laughs> I always heard to him as Rudy Nazi bastard Giuliani. You know, <laughs> so we don't have that now, and that and that's good. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I didn't really mention, some people don't know. Actually, I also used to promote my parties at Tunnel back in the day. It was called the Solution, Spontaneous Groove Open Jam. It was a common ground for diverse expression, uh, open mic jam session in the library. And um, it evolved into me opening up my own nightclub called Sutra Lounge, which was on first and first for 10 years. And it, too on the corner of first and first was meant to represent the crossroads and the intersectionality of New York. And for 10 years, um, my main focus was to make sure that that room on two floors had every single person in the universe represented. The foundation was old school hip hop because that community didn't have a home and wasn't welcome in the early 2000s. 
And because of that, because I was a primarily urban crowd, but highly diverse, we did have a lot of march operations. We had a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, we the number one noisiest bar with the most complaints, which red flagged us for every inspection. Almost every week we would be marched on with multi-agency inspections. And I was nuisance abated and I was shut down because of that diversity. And it was because of that diversity we were targeted. And ultimately what inspired me, motivated me, politicized me to help change it from within to seeing Chief Madry here on this stage today talking about that evolutionary change. But it does still exist in New York, but the criminalization of it, I think and hope, is coming down. And, and that's I can tell you in important. our early nightlife association meetings in my little conference room when Ariel was on the executive board, that level of, of, you know, of intensity was, <laughs> she was always there, and we're going to correct these wrongs. And you know, we used to have you know, uh, nightclub clients call me you know, the day after the police you know, came and shut down their place for a couple of hours. Um, you know, lights on, music off, giving you a health department violation because there was a fruit fly, you know, in, in, in a bottle of, you know, a, a sticky alcohol. Um, any stuff that could have been done at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and said was being done at 2 o'clock at night. Um, but they would say that the, the sergeant would pull them aside and put their arm around them and move them aside and say, if you get rid of this hip-hop crowd, you'll be okay with us. And what do I do, Bookman? That sounds like racism. <laughs> you think? It does. <laughs> So, so it's better now. Hmm? It's it is much better now, as far as that goes. I mean, you, you this morning. This is an evolutionary process. You know, we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go because it's it's systemic, and there are not alternative solutions that they have known in the past. Right, and so it's not just about saying that's wrong. It's about introducing something that's better. Right, because it's, it's, if that's all the only tool you have, that's not enough. And so that's what the work that we're all supposed to be doing in this room is not just to identify what's wrong, but to be able to come up with common sense, non-enforcement, mutually beneficial solutions that support an industry that recognizes its, its value, but also the necessity for quality of life and safety that works for everybody, and that's the goal. And Ariel, and, and, and the work we've done for years, and, and you know, you know and, and Richie's aware of it, you know, is that it, it, the problem was not the music that's being played, you know, that, you know, and the problem was not 95% of the people going to see that music. There were problem people. Uh, you know, Carolyn Richmond's, you know, uh, before on employment law, she was saying she hates dress codes. You know, the problem is not somebody wearing a cap and ripped jeans, you know, and, and pants that may be low. It's that some people are disruptive. And that's what we have to focus in it's on. It's also a racist door policy. You know, yeah, not how they look, <laughs> you know, and, and, and not. So I think, you know, I think Ariel's done a great job in, you know, meeting with the police on a regular basis. I mean, and, you know, and, and I think it's a more diverse and more police department that recognizes the importance of nightlife now to a large extent because of what she's done for the last five years. So do I think it's better today than when we were fighting, uh, you know, you know with Giuliani thinking nobody belonged out late at night? Yeah, I think it's better. Where do you guys think nightlife is going in the next five years in New York? Talk to her. Talk to her. Talk to that all, all, of, all of y'all. Oh. She is nightlife. Gosh. <laughs> I make a joke. Well, it's all going online. It's digital. It's crypto. It's NFTs. Everyone's gonna be in like these digital nightlife. What are those? Oculus. Club Oculus. Uh, no. People want to party in person. I, I have what I think and I have what I want, and so I'll share a little bit of both. Uh, I like the micro clubs. It's, it's a sort of pendulum swing from like the mega raves and people are going like huge, you know, just like these massive warehouses. I mean, we love tech support. We love these sort of, these big, big things that are happening now. And if you think about how trends and culture go, I've seen so many wonderful little spaces that are maybe 100 to 500 capacity. And, you know, little local DJs. Their name's not even on the flyer sometimes. And I just love that, which means that younger people with less money 
right? These small, tiny little business owners with a little bit of a dream can actually have, uh, it's a lower barrier to entry, right? As far as getting into the business. They're not trying to fundraise $5 million to open up a thousand person cap. They're like, I just want to, I just want to play my super weird, uh, niche electronic music for my hundred friends and serve some orange wine. And I think that's super cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I pretty much think today it's more of a cheat code mm -hmm. in uh, nightlife. Because when I first started going out, the main reason I wanted to go out, it wasn't a business. It was to have these experiences. You want to hear certain music, you couldn't go online now with the cheat code and see, hey, go to Beatport, go to Spotify and find this music. You had to go to the club. Mm -hmm. And that's why Peter created the stage. And the stage was bigger than the DJs. It didn't matter who DJed. People went in there because they broke music. And that was the only place you could hear it. And the same thing with clothes. You couldn't go online and Google, I wish I wear a Coachella this year. You actually had to go to the club. And, and if I saw someone in, I saw them like, hey, where did you get those kicks? And you spoke and you mingled. That's another big thing where you went out and you actually mingled. Mm -hmm. And you know, too many people, Kate brought up the best thing, saying that it is all about experiences. And there's all different experiences. That's what's going to keep nightlife going is creating experiences. Because mm -hmm. we have to get over that cheat code mentality with, with internet and social media that people feel like they can watch it from home and thinking they're experiencing it. No, they're watching. It's watching like a Netflix series. They're not experiencing anything. Yeah. W one thing that's worse though, and Kay just mentioned it, you know, that's worse than when, when we opened Peter's Clubs is the liquor licensing process in New York now. There was no community boards then. There was no 500 foot law then. Uh, you know, we got through the government process and he was licensed. And, and now it is virtually, in New, York, in New York State, in New York City, particularly your step one in, in applying to open a place is you have to go to this community board. And it's local, politically appointed volunteers who tend to be my age or older, um, you know, and haven't gone out in 50 years. <laughs> and, um, you know, and you know, they, they, you know, if you look up NIMBY in the dictionary, it's <laughs> pictures of a community board. And, and all they care about is the quality of life on their block, and that's it. And I can't, and I tell clients right now, you know, th there is no place except for Times Square that nobody wants to open. Uh, there is no place to open a club that's going to be, have the maximum allowable hours by law, 4 a.m., you know, in New York City anymore. Vir virtually none. I tell people, don't even bother unless you're taking over a place that was previously open to 4 o'clock because we can't get through the community board process. So it's becoming an earlier and earlier city. Uh, also, live music has been killed by the community board liquor license process in the city of New York. We used to be a center of live music. We, so, so, live music formed, certain types of live music started here in New York City. You can't go now to a community board. Uh, virtually everyone has on their checklist, you know, a separate question, for live music, yes or no. And what's the difference if it's live music? It, it's, it's volume that you're concerned about. You know, it's not, not, you know, and if you say live music, I could not get a CBGB, you know, open in the city of New York today. A new CBGB, you know, could, could not get a liquor license. For now. For now. <laughs> you know, and we had, we had, you know, Wetlands, Coney Island High, Brownies. I mean, we had so many, you know, cool music places all gone and they're, you know, they would probably be gone by now anyway, but they're not being replaced, you know, by the next cool live music venue. Mm. Fuck. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we need it. It's yeah, so it, stupid. And there's so, so it's many so empty places ready to be There's so taken many over. empty. It really is a once in a generational opportunity right now, and it has been since COVID, for people to get into the business without deep pockets, you know, in many of your cities, because traditionally, the only two ways to, you know, go into the business. One is, like Peter, you take a vacant space, you pour zillions of dollars and get 4,000 inspections, you know, before you can open. Or, you, you know, or you bought, you know, uh, you know, Bookman's Club, you know, and I'm ready to retire and that's my pension. So you're paying me a lot of money. Now you got lots of vacant turnkey places that people without deep pockets could go into, but they're having a hard time getting their liquor license. I do want to speak to this other sort of trend, uh, which I like to call healthy hedonism. So, of course, we're trying to talk about like, liquor licenses. Guess what? Cannabis licenses are coming up. The psychedelic revolution is here, right? And non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic. People are, people are raving with either sober or they're not drinking alcohol. They're, you know, they're experimenting with all sorts of other things. 
whether it's like plant-based sort of anthropogenics, right? Or they're like, okay, cool, like ketamine's a whole thing. You could get like ketamine therapy now. These things are crazy. I mean, this is wild. This was not a thing. And you know, I mean, it was definitely it was definitely on the dance floors, was but it ketamine, wasn't. ketamine. It wasn't there therapy. Were right, right, right. <laughs> I, I would. Argue, there were no drugs in the nightclubs was, in the eighties. It was. Uh, it's all brand new. No, it's very sober. <laughs> so I just think that's very interesting as we think about where where culture's going and where spaces for dance and celebration community are going. That it won't be so alcohol centric as it used to be. Yes, you should still have a liquor license because you know, like, but it there will be more options on the menu. Interesting. I'm very optimistic about the future, personally. I know it's bleak, and we still have systemic issues with these gatekeepers that are the NIMBY gatekeepers of culture and economy and neighborhood um, development. But, you know, there is an evolution of thought. There is progress. There is, I think, the pandemic showed more than anything, or there were so many things, but one of many things is, you know, a, a greater appreciation and gratitude for what we almost lost in this industry. And I think that was clearly evident even to those who are the most against it, and that it's essential for our recovery and for our personal well being and for their jobs. And so we do have to seize this moment. Um, to keep pushing the envelope and to demand respect, demand support. And I do believe with all the activism and all the organizing and all the work of everyone in this room and RHI and the Hospitality Alliance that we and the, the future uh, director of the Office of Nightlife, like we are all now pushing against the machine in the same direction and we will go further. Which is so important also because um, I've, this is my 25th year in New York. I moved here in 98. And I, while I don't go out that much anymore, I do go out and I'm very much a part of New York. And in and, and a lot of ways, New York is at its most hedonistic as it has been in the 25 years I've been here, you know? So it's, and also there's, uh, there's you know, more Giuliani types that we don't even know about yet that are waiting in the wings to. <laughs> you know, ruin all of our future good times. So like, it really is an important time to know that the city is so hedonistic and that there, and in many really positive ways and that people uh, wanna have fun, um, but that there are a lot of problems that, you know, and bad people to avoid, I don't know, right? No, but, it, but there's a lot of people having fun. It, it comes down to it that COVID actually, you know, brought out these 311 callers that silence New York and it continues to silence. Like, you know, I look at something as simple as Woe Up, uh, even though it's not a nightclub, it's, it was a restaurant. Like, I, I didn't even know growing up that Woe Up was open before two or three o'clock in the morning and <laughs> now it closes at 10, 11 p.m. It's just, we, we got to fight to bring the late, you know, keep it the, back to the city that never sleeps because it, it's falling asleep. Sleeps. I know, it it's sleeps. falling asleep. It's even in the restaurants you see. At 6.30 to 9.30 is a sweet spot. You could get into any top restaurant at 10 p.m. You could get a seating. It's just... You, I mean, we're still recovering, right? We can't forget that the entire world was hit by a truck, you know, and we're still in that recovery. So to think that it's falling asleep or that New York is not what it was or the world isn't what it was, it, it isn't what it was. But we are recovering. We are restoring. The youth will keep growing and wanting to go out, and we're going to be okay. Okay, and we just have to keep making sure these systems are in place that are supporting the revival and the new renaissance of sociability and uh, making sure we're taking this opportunity to get it right as we recover. And we can't let the people who are paying $5 million for a studio dictate you know, what the rest of the you know, city wants their nightlife to be. Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> Should we take questions oh. in our last few minutes? Let's take some questions. Does anyone? We have five minutes for questions. Uh, you guys talked about like dancing culture. I guess that was really important. Uh, with like it's another one of those other clubs that kind of bringing people together. Uh, what are your thoughts on just like the, the new club model where like, you can go to like the latest newest club and it's all sections and it's all dancing because it's about that bottle culture of yeah. spending more money and then it's about having different comments. How do you kind of manage and shift that culture while keeping, I guess, you know, the dance floor alive where a lot of the diversity happens at? 
I people would, still want to dance. Yeah, people want to dance. I actually don't. Just not dancing in the chair. Yeah, you know, like the, standing on the section. Can you can you like repeat succinctly your question? Just I don't know if everybody. The, the, the question is so how do you keep the dancing culture alive that you guys talked about was the melting pot in the '90s and the '80s. Now where a lot of clubs are, are the dance floor is smaller and the sections are bigger. If it wasn't so expensive to run a club, maybe these people would consider having less tables. I agree with I agree with that. And plus, like I said earlier in my earlier part, where the, it was a stage people went out because they had a break in music. Now people are more educated because of the cheat code of, of internet, and they learn about these DJs. And you know, we do a lot of warehouse parties and different things, and that's where people go and they want to have, because they they're following the talent and they're educated more about the music because it is online. It wasn't like that before. So, and plus a lot of the table service venues, restaurants became like the new nightclub. Cause I remember when I first started going out, I would go to, let's say an Italian restaurant, white tablecloths, pictures of Frank Sinatra on the wall. And I left by 10 PM, it was done. And we went to the club. And now it's, you have these big vibe dining places where People extend their nights. There's a bar scene now. They look like clubs. They're built like, you know, table service nightclubs. I mean, I think people are always going to want to dance, and it's about creating space for them to do that. Um, we're getting the happy face. I'm going to allow for one more question because we started late. <laughs> Andrew Riggi and... Great conversation. Um, you know, it's like every generation, it's always like, oh man, if these kids knew how cool it was when I used to go out, you know, they don't, and that's every generation. So like, what do you think the generation that's going out right now is gonna be telling the younger generation uh, when they're older saying, like what, what's great about New York City nightlife right now? It's wild. The kids are crazy and they are partying so hard and they look great. <laughs> Whatever the next Instagram is invented, or if it is Instagram, they're all just going to see it on that. It's different. It's Everything's called, it's captured. Called, it's called TikTok. <laughs> yeah, there she's right. Unless they get rid of it now. All right. <laughs> I mean, just being an observer of House of Yet, yes, I mean, the creativity, the fashion, the love of music, the love of life, the love of getting together. I mean, you can't hold it down. You can't hold it down with a cop. You can't hold it down with the government. You can't hold it down. If, if it's repressed, it'll find the underground. It will, that's why if we just support it, we can keep it safe, keep it something that um, is beneficial to everyone because it's innate. We all need to socialize. We all need to dance, and it's going to happen. So let's do it right. Round of applause for our moderator. No. Great job, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here.